Alright, good day folks. Welcome to the podcast number five, Troy, Homer's epic tale in the Iliad, one of his most famous poems of all time. It's a story of love, deception, of vengeance, of wrath, pride, war, and tragedy. Woohoo! Yeah. For 23 <laughs> minutes of, of this podcast. And I broke rule numero uno of podcasting, which is make sure your fucking microphone is plugged <laughs> in and working. So uh, we spoke at each other for basically 23 minutes uh, with no microphone audio being uh, picked up. Yeah, bear with us, folks. This is <laughs> podcast number five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. We're we're allowed to make these mistakes at this point still. So. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I'm pretty stoked about this. From 2004, one of my favorite action slash battle historical whatever movies epic of all time. Movies. Yeah. yeah, very epic movie. We also watched the Netflix series Troy: Fall of a City, mm-hmm. and we even read a little, you know, some little snippets of Homer's original myth, uh, the Iliad. Yes, and I'll also be referencing some stuff from the Greek myths, gods, monsters, heroes, and the origins of storytelling by Stephen P. Kershaw, who I think is like a professor or something. Yeah. And it's just like this very slim book. Of, <laughs> <laughs> it's not slim at all. It's just about the Iliad and other Greek myths and yes. um, stories. And it has a lot of uh, context and other information. The central question that's going to be guiding our conversation is, what about the story of Troy makes it so timeless and appealing? And that's something that we were talking about for quite a while, which is this is such a universal tale in a way, even though it's very specific to Greek myth, Greek culture. There's some parts about this that are present uh, in a lot of other stories. And of course, there are a lot of stories that borrow these themes or even these uh, certain traits of certain characters, obviously. It's funny because it seems, compared to some of the things that we read and watch today, like Game of Thrones or Lord of the Rings or, you know, any number of, of you know, crime shows, dramas, mm-hmm. etc., it seems like a very rudimentary and kind of uh, uh, primeval kind of myth. Mm-hmm. But it, I think because it's so, uh, to use a very 21st century <laughs> slang term, basic <laughs> that's why it, it's very wholesome in a way yeah. uh in a weird way because it's it, a classic right yeah it's where it kind of all started and then now we've kind of created all sorts of monsters in terms of stories yeah. and plots and things think of it kind of like it's like veal parmesan or something <laughs> like a really nice rustic italian dish and then you compare that with what we have today which is you know like this foo fooey modern food that like you they measure out sauce using rulers Mm. and they they fold things and they make it look like it's not even really food anymore (laughs) both things are kind of nice in their own right but you got to go back to your roots and have that nice stick to your ribs kind of food Mm -hmm. and so to me and i guess to you shalini as well like that's what the story kind of is yeah. Uh, you know, like it's warm and fuzzy, even though it's actually quite scary and horrifying. It's a, <laughs> it's a terrible tragedy, and I think I would add that um, it's it's such a it's a story that can be replicated in so many ways and still be a refreshing tale. Um, ever since uh, before the time of Christ till the twenty first century, we've been creating adaptations of this very. I don't know, encapsulating tale for many people beyond the the Greeks. And it's kind of infiltrated sort of a global sort of stance in terms of storytelling. Um, that's why, like, even now in 2018, there's a freaking Netflix TV show as if we did, as if Troy 2004 wasn't it enough. Yeah. Um, it's just to show different perspectives and emphasize different personal and political and religious values, whatever um, is kind of current at that time. So it's kind of interesting in that right where there's just so much to say about this epic even 3,000 years later or whatever. Yeah. Is it 3,000 years yeah, later? Yeah, I, th- I think it's like, yeah, yeah three, uh, three or... Something like that. Yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> a long-ass time ago, okay? <laughs> yeah. The next question that we will ask is, was the fall of Troy actually real? Um, but before we do that, we want to give everyone some context frankly we could probably devote 10 podcasts to talk about this 
<laughs> yeah, and the thing with the plot is that there's so many renderings of the story that we don't know which one is real. I mean, you can read like Homer's Iliad, and that's like one version of this perhaps historical event. So you can read Homer's Iliad and just have this one account, but then there's so mm. many others, like innumerable. Like there's stories on pottery, on probably like clay tablets of this story. So it's just hard to kind of account for all the little plot events that happen. But yeah. have have your shot at the summary. Here. <laughs> Best yeah. of luck. <laughs> yeah, my favorite part, summarization. So basically, we're in ancient Greece in the Bronze Age. And two Trojan princes, one named Hector and the other named Paris. I don't know whether or not he's actually the namesake of the city in France. <laughs> um, but I don't like Paris. Not the French city. I've never <laughs> been. I heard it's great. I heard it's awesome. Um, I don't really like Paris that much because he does some really naughty things that end up uh, basically resulting in his nation being destroyed. Yep. But... Uh, you know, for sake of brevity, I'm just going to go and say they go and hang out with this king in Sparta named Menelaus. And Menelaus is a straight up gangster playboy <laughs> lover of women and of conquering shit. And he's got an older brother named Agamemnon who's even better at that and who wants to create a Greek empire. They're just hanging out and having a big party, etc. I think they had a peace deal or something like that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, Menelaus' father dies, and so he has to go to Crete, which is this uh, island south of the, the Greek mainland, uh, far away, uh, to attend his father's funeral. So basically that leaves uh, Menelaus' wifey, Helen, who happens to be the most beautiful woman in the world. Just happens, no you less. know. Yeah, objectively the most beautiful. Like, they've categorized all the women in the world, and she, number one. Yeah, it's science. <laughs> she is. Yeah, and she's played by uh, Diane Kruger in, in the 2004 film. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, but you know who would know who is the most beautiful woman in the world? It's Aphrodite. Exactly. So the goddesses, or who, I don't know who actually puts it together, but there's a beauty contest. Oh, it's uh, Eris? I think he's Eris. the god of strife or something like that. Yeah, because he's, 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 he's an asshole. And so he, he sets up a beauty contest where Paris, the Trojan prince, has to choose which goddess is the most beautiful. And it's Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena. Athena excuse me. And each of them offer Paris like a bribe if you, if you give the golden apple the title of the most beautiful goddess or whatever, uh, you're going to get some sort of earthly reward from us. And so Hera uh, says, you're going to be a great ruler if you choose me. Athena says, you're going to be a great warrior if, and win many battles if you pick me. And Aphrodite says, if you pick me, you're going to fall in love with the most beautiful woman in the world and she'll fall in love with you. Ooh. So knowing the male mind <laughs> and the mind of a hot-blooded red-blooded trojan yeah. prince he picks aphrodite and this has dire consequences of course uh as a side note the other two goddesses are, are uh, scorned by this and they choose the side of the greeks in the coming trojan war and aphrodite stays on the side of troy and of course king menelaus of sparta comes back and is like bro where's my wife at <laughs> like someone stole her no nah. he goes to his older brother and he goes, hey, dude, so this guy, like, dishonored me and, like, basically insulted all of Greece by stealing my wife. And his brother's like, oh, man, and I love conquering shit, so we're going to go and start a big-ass war. <laughs> and so they launched one of the biggest military campaigns in all of uh, history at the time. A thousand ships. A thousand ships sail set sail to Troy to destroy it. And uh, it's really interesting because in this process they unite so many different greek nations basically all of them mm -hmm. and there's actually what is it is it a thousand and six or a, a thousand one hundred and six ships 43, 43 chieftains yeah. and 19 heroes or 16 heroes something like that yeah so that's that includes odysseus achilles ajax a bunch of others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. 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 And Homer actually made like an itemized list of all these different people. So Yeah, it's called the the catalog of something. I can't remember. But yeah. it's a catalog. It's like a Sears catalog of <laughs> all the people who were involved in the Trojan War. <laughs> Sears catalog. <laughs> yeah. And we were talking about how it's very uh 
Martin-esque, this yes. uh, world building that uh, Homer's taking part in by having such specific numbers of and names of people and and ships and whatnot. Um, and that's why it kind of it lends credence to that argument that maybe this is actually based on a, a true historical event mm-hmm. and uh, the myth you know the mythological parts of it are maybe not as mythological as we think yeah in the sense that you know this might have actually taken place and yeah and I think um, another argument that's made is that a lot of Greek culture especially Greek war culture surrounds honor or I think it's called like Timae or tm or something like that so that's basically another word for honor or pride or like one's ego essentially (laughs) having all the names of the ships and the chieftains and heroes that ascertains everyone's sort of pride and honor is met so everyone knows that achilles was at that battle and that's very important for Mm -hmm. achilles and the memory of achilles because all the heroes wanted immortality throughout the ages they wanted to be known that's something that a lot of the adaptations pick up is the immortality of being known uh, beyond. So it's almost like metafictional in that way, you know? Yeah. Like these adaptations, they they take like in the Iliad, like Achilles is wished for immortality and they make it so that it's like self-conscious of itself. Like the movie knows that Achilles wants to be immortalized yeah. and immortalizes him, right? Yeah. Like 3,000 years later, there's this movie about him and it shows him wanting to be in this movie, essentially. Like he obviously doesn't know that movies will exist, but that people will sing songs about him and all of that. So yeah. it's very interesting in that way. Yeah, well, the movie sang a pretty good song to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. So <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, the box office. <laughs> we're going to let, we're going to use our, you know, contemporary standards of success and say that it was a smash hit and a smash <laughs> hit for Achilles' memory. Yes. Let's put it that way. Um Going back to the summary, the Greek army lands on the beach of Troy, sets up camp there, and proceeds to uh, besiege the city for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, many battles are fought, some heroes have duels, people are killed, lives are destroyed, etc. But at one point, the brilliant Ithacan uh, Greek Odysseus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Odysseus. Yeah. Come on. That's how one of my professors used to say it, yeah. Odysseus who is the principal character of the Odyssey, which comes after the Trojan War. Um, But he comes up with the brilliant scheme to create the Trojan horse, which is this big wooden horse. And the army then uh, abandons the field and sails away. And so the Trojans believe that this is an offering to them uh, as a sign of defeat or, you know, like an acknowledgement of defeat, surrender, etc. And uh, an offering to the gods even. And so they bring this horse into their city, but lo and behold, Odysseus and his men, Odysseus and his men <laughs> oh, are... Oh God, it's catching up on <laughs> I you. Know, I know, I'm starting, I'm starting to be infected with this, these weird pronunciations. <laughs> Don't um, start saying bag, uh, bagel. Bagel. Sort of bagel. Yeah, garage. Garage. Oof, stop it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so they, you know, they are inserted into the city. They open the gates. Uh, the army and the, and the fleet come back in the night. Troy is sacked, burned to the ground. The nation is destroyed like mm-hmm. that. Uh, complete tragedy. So Yeah. I can't make the, the penetration joke the way that you said it this time around. Because <laughs> <laughs> I made the whole joke that the soldiers were like sperm that infiltrated the Troy's walls. And uh, yeah, it created a baby of destruction. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. To a continue. baby of destruction. <laughs> yeah. That's how you sound when you said that. <laughs> well, I couldn't just say it all cute, no. Yeah, yeah, no, you couldn't. Yeah, it's but uh, it's kind of weird. Then a, a condom company yeah. decides to name its rubbers after uh, the Trojan horse, and then you know computer viruses are called Trojans. Some mm-hmm. of them. Yes, more aptly than a condom. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's asshole viruses. When we were watching the movie, and uh, you know, there's that scene where the, they're bringing the horse to the city. Everyone's jubilant and showering it with rose petals and singing. <laughs> I'm like, this is the act of penetration right here. <laughs> Perfect metaphor. Yeah. Yeah, and then basically, this is the consequence if you uh, don't wear. Yes. Rubber. <laughs> don't wear rubber. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> this is basically. Yeah. So innuendos and sex talk aside. We're going to talk about whether or not the fall of Troy was actually real. Mm-hmm. 
important question. Yes. Elephant in the room for many, many people who read or experience this story is that, was it really true? Like, did this actually happen? Did Paris and Helen and King Priam and Hector and Agamemnon, did they all exist? Or is it just a myth? Was Troy a real city? Was was Homer basing things on, like, an existing city or a past fabled city? Like, where is this coming from, basically? Yeah. And we found some answers through good old BBC and National Geographic documentaries. <laughs> yep. So yeah. we have all the answers here for you guys. Yeah, yeah. literally all of them. All of them that you'll ever need to know. <laughs> Most of it is no one knows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Most annoying answer of all. Yeah. Yeah, in the 19th century, there was German archaeologists who went to uh, a location in northwestern Turkey, which is modern-day Turkey, and they were um, looking at this site where there was lots of ruins, pottery, found remnants of weapons, of, and they found the bones of humans and animals uh, amassed, and they also found evidence of a large fire that had occurred mm-hmm. in this area. But basically, what people think is that uh, this German archaeologist named Schliemann. Yes. Fucking Schliemann. Schliemann, the, sh- the, the Schlees. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he, they believe that he actually discovered Troy. And he discovered actual layers of this uh, settlement that had been developed over thousands of years. They actually it's, uh, speculate that it's 5,000 years old. And so wow. they built different portions of it over time. Mm-hmm. And yes, they basically unearthed a whole bunch of evidence. So I'm fairly convinced. Again, it's like we like we kind of discussed earlier. You know, the mythological aspects aside, there might well have actually been a very large conflict that took place, and the tr- the city might have been actually raised. Um, so yeah, definitely. I'm sold on it, frankly. So <laughs> for me, I think the. The sacking and burning of Troy probably occurred, but I'm not convinced that it was this particular story of Helen of Sparta becoming Helen Helen of Troy and that being the excuse for the Greeks to come and conquer Troy. It could be. I don't know. It just seems like too much of a classic, timeless, sort of heavy in themes and symbolisms. And um, it's like a, a moral story for humans to not be rash or greedy. It's a bit too much of that for me. So I think, for me personally, I think it's Homer creating the story to explain why Troy was raised to the ground, um, which happened hundreds of years before he actually wrote the Iliad. So another cool thing about the location of the Troy settlement that uh, Heimlich, Heimlich, (laughs) Schliemann, his first name is like Heimlich or something. I think that's actually a last name. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, like, I, I apologize to all Germans Heim- right now. Heinrich? Hein- yeah, it's like yeah. Heinrich Schliemann or something yeah. like that. Let's call him Henry. Why not? Henry. <laughs> Just completely <laughs> bastardize everything about this guy. Yeah. When they discovered the settlement, they actually, um, the settlement is in, quite inland. And something that's central to the story of Troy is that the Greeks uh, beached upon the coast of Troy and they made their camp on the beach. So it had to be near the water. Um, So they actually dived into the farmland of Troy, surrounding Troy, and they found that the sediments there are actually marine sediments. And they dated precisely like 2,500 years ago or something. And that's when the fall of Troy was supposed to have happened. Mm -hmm. So it seems that um, the the shore did reach um, that area near surrounding Troy, at that time when Troy was supposed to have existed yeah. and perhaps afterwards as well. I know. Yeah, that was really striking. It, yeah. it, like, that was, I think, the one thing that convinced me the most. Mm-hmm. The other thing that was convincing was, again, the evidence of, of a, a huge fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, there was also the, um, the uh, arrow and spearheads that were embedded into the walls of the city. Like the city. Mm-hmm. They found those. And then... Um, there was actually they uh, Schliemann found uh, this pathway, like this kind of like this ramp up that would have led through the gate, and Homer describes it as being uh, wide enough to accommodate two chariots, and it was exactly that wide. Mm-hmm. So there's again, there's just all this evidence that's congruent with what Homer describes and like what we 
Noah's to be, I guess, you know, in quotes, fact about this, uh, about this event. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I was sold in it. Like, this is definitely Troy. This place was definitely, (laughs) like, burned to the ground. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I I would actually kind of agree with you that um, it's likely that it's the story is kind of like an accompaniment to whatever actually happened happened here. Yeah. Um, that's something that I think we'll never be able to confirm, obviously. Cause... Yeah. Unless we find the most beautiful skeleton in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and it's Helen <laughs> in that settlement. Other than that, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, she actually she actually escaped this. Oh, yeah. This whole that's true. thing. Her yeah. and Paris did, you know, just, you know, the, the sick irony of the whole thing. Fucking Paris. You know, okay. they're but the they ones who separated. start this. They are separated, though, so. Yeah. Well, good. <laughs> Harsh as that sounds. I know. But um, even in uh, the Greek myths book that I was uh, looking at, they talked about how the story is, might actually be a shorthand for what the Greeks were doing around that time, which was kind of uh, amassing this great Greek empire um, and, in, in their words, in this book's words, colonizing the sort of regions around uh greece so this this story of troy might just be like sort of moral story against doing such sort of heinous violent crimes or just objectively stating what um like historically what was happening around that time so we kind of know that the city of troy must have been real we don't know if the story itself was real but Please tell me, Morgan, why are there so many adaptions of this tale um, ever since uh, before the time of Christ and now into the 21st century? I think there's so many adaptations because it's a story that we've talked about before that has value that is timeless in the sense that there's messages and there's themes and characters that we see kind of reoccurring and that we still draw meaning from. And you mentioned, you know, politically, historically, culturally, um, there's so many things that are influenced by this story. And so the adaptations that we're primarily talking about are, uh, well, we're gonna, obviously we're talking about Homer's actual Iliad, and then we're talking about Troy in two, from 2004, the f- great film that I love, and then also the Netflix series, uh, Troy, Fall of a City. And so each of them kind of focuses on this story differently. Um, it's kind of weird to say that about Homer's Iliad because that's the original. <laughs> the two contemporary adaptations, uh, they have a very different kind of lens through which they view the uh, the plot. Yeah, and I think perspective and perception is uh, the reason why it's so translatable down through the ages because any any culture and any time era can add their own sort of emphasis to different aspects of the story so you can view this story from so many different angles because there's so many different characters um so for example um homer himself um like his iliad is sometimes known as the tragedy of hector and even though hector is a secondary character he does go through such tragedy because he has to fight this war for his stupid brother who like just happens to fall in love with this woman and he's like, oh, fine, okay, so we're going to do this now. And then he has to go duel the fabled Achilles, who is um, half deity, kind of. Her, his uh, mother is half nymph, sea nymph, and uh, he is half mortal from his father's side. And he is invincible because he was dipped in the river Styx and that made him invincible except his heel. And no one really knows that he has this weakness until someone pierces him in the heel right yeah he, I think yeah. he gets shot through the heel yeah hector has to fight achilles and then he is murdered by achilles and achilles murders him because uh hector kills patroclus who was achilles cousin and achilles loved patroclus <laughs> and it's just a mess right like it's just yeah. it just talks about human pride and and it's so central to the concept of t- uh, Timae. I think that's the yeah. pronunciation. Timae. 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 Yeah, Timae. 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 yeah Timae. that sounds more Greek. <laughs> Timae. Yeah. Um, this whole concept of honor and having to avenge what, um, something that's been done wrong to you. Um, so you can see it from Hector's side. Obviously, you can see it from Paris's side. Um, little wimp that he is. <laughs> you can see him from Achilles' side. So he didn't want to fight in this war, but he was just kind of summoned. And Agamemnon is his overlord, if not his king, even though he doesn't really like him. 
And then um, Achilles takes this concubine named Briseis, and Agamemnon steals Briseis during the this battle, during the siege of Troy, while this is going on. And Achilles just, he's like, okay, that's it, I'm leaving. You just took my prize, I'm done. I'm done with you. Okay, and the only reason that Achilles comes back is because Patroclus was murdered, and um, Hector thought Patroclus was Achilles because Patroclus was wearing Achilles' armor while they were dueling. Yeah. yeah. So that was a rough one. And it was so funny in the in the movie when, when Patroclus was killed. He's like this young boy, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone just, once Hector takes the, the helmet off and you see this young boy there, everyone's like, oh, shit. Yeah, <laughs> like, they're like, okay, this is too yeah. far. This young boy, he's been murdered in cold blood. Okay, we're going home. Yeah, yeah. I know. Like, they, they all, like, they just get so discouraged. And, like, it's just like, oh, I feel dirty now. I'm yeah. going to go home. And Sean Bean and Eric Bana have this. <laughs> <laughs> they have, they have, so Sean Bean plays, is uh, Odysseus and Eric Bana is Hector and they're just like okay we're gonna call it a day let's go home yeah. <laughs> they're, they're on opposite sides and they're like one day we're just gonna mourn for this kid it's so yeah. funny yeah, but so you can see it from Achilles's tragedy so there's all these different ways to sort of read this um, very timeless tale because it's so moldable into what you want to emphasize another cool thing that I kind of picked up was this idea of honor and guess right um if you've read game of thrones or watched game of thrones or um have seen our podcast about it which is our first one um the red wedding is a huge event and um plot twist and sort of a catalyst for the entire rest of a song of ice and fire undoubtedly yes in the political sense Right up in uh, before the Red Wedding happens in the Storm of Swords, there's a lot of tales that are kind of um, Martin just drops in there about um, violations of guest right. So there's the one about um, the rat cook. So I think I can't remember if it's in the Night's Watch, but basically someone who violates guest rights turns into a rat and he is doomed to eat his own um, offspring for the rest of eternity or whatever mm-hmm. some some sick shit like that and basically <laughs> the whole moral of that tale is don't break guest right so once someone has eaten your meat and drank your meat and has slept by your fire you cannot harm them and that's basically what um walder frey does during the red wedding when he slays rob stark and the rest of his entourage yeah mr filch was a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah he he didn't like all the mess that they made Um, (laughs) so and it's interesting that that's such a um common theme in a in a very modern fantasy tale right like this is like a a modern tale in our time but it still links back to the iliad because um, paris essentially violates guest right by stealing menelaus's wife so this is kind of switched the other way where you can't disrespect your host like that you can't mm-hmm. just steal someone's wife. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's not really Menelaus's love that makes him fight back for Helen. It's this violation of his own hospitality, um, Greek nationality, um, and basically his own ego in that he can't be cuckolded like this. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was kind of interesting, that sort of um, overarching th- theme in, in fantasy in general about guest right and... Um, what is proper behavior when you're dealing with separate cultures and separate peoples. So differences in perspective in Troy from 2004 and then Troy, Fall of the City, the Netflix special from uh, this year. Wasn't it from this year? I think so. 2018? Yeah. Yeah, 2017 maybe. Yeah. Very, very recent. 2004 Troy is definitely Achilles' movie. Like, mm. It is his or his story. Well, it is his movie, but yeah, it's his, <laughs> it's his story as we've established. Um, it's very focused on good old BP, who plays Achilles, and uh, his um, experience in the Trojan War. It's definitely through his eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's far less um, attention that's paid to the Trojan side of things. It's kind of like they're presented as the opposing side in this story Mm -hmm. in some respects but i feel like overall the film actually portrays them very equally 
it kind of shows the Greek rationale very well and the Trojan rationale behind what they're uh, thinking in terms of how they participate in the war, what the reasons are for fighting. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember when I was a kid, when I watched it, because it came out again in 2004, when I watched it, I remember kind of like, I felt like I was rooting for the Greek side a bit more. Oh, really? Because I kind of understood like why it's, like, I was like, you yeah. know, I stole the wife, it's yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yes. Simplistic common sense from back in the yeah. day. Yeah. And plus, I you know, I, just, I love like Brad Pitt's portrayal of this character because mm-hmm. he's such an amazing character in the sense that, and we're going to talk about the characters in a little bit, um, but he is just incredible in terms of, his martial prowess and he's a great warrior and he kills lots of people and he's just like and he's also got a big smart mouth which is yeah. awesome too <laughs> you know he's not like one of like these cold you know stern killers like he's actually like a, a douche on top of the fact yeah. that he's you know a great warrior uh you know and he's got like a salty sense of humor it's great he's also hunky <laughs> yeah, dreamy brad Pitt. stud <laughs> yeah total stud um who do you think is portrayed as the bad guy in? So you said that you had more sympathy for the Greeks when you were younger. Yeah, it, it, it's funny because I think that Menelaus is undoubtedly the bad, or excuse me, well, yeah, him yeah. and then Agamemnon are both the bad guys yeah. in every single portrayal yeah. of, of the story, like or yeah. every adaptation of the story. And I think even in Homer's Iliad, like it's it's definitely shown that these guys are you know not to be trifled with and it's kind of clear why that is Mm -hmm. because they go and they bring a thousand ships and tens of thousands of greeks who want to destroy the city yeah Um, funny thing is actually the the trojans were perceived as the villains at a certain point in time so i believe it was the 8th century gonna do some fact checking yeah oh okay in 5th century greece uh persia or persians invaded greece and so at that time, uh, the renditions and uh, adaptations of the Troy story, the Trojans were viewed as barbarians because mm-hmm. I guess they were more, they looked more like Persians and they associated more with Persians. And Greeks kind of viewed them, well, obviously, themselves as the, the good guys. But um, so, yeah, at that time in, um, of history, the Trojans were actually viewed as the villains and they were the barbarians who stole the wife and all that kind of stuff. But in today's uh, adaptations, which is really interesting, we have a bit more sympathy um, and there's a bit more um, emphasis on Helen as, as the wife who doesn't want to be the wife mm-hmm. of Menelaus and it was her choice to leave. Um, so it's very interesting what time and um, influences have to do with how we view certain character motives and stuff in stories absolutely i think overall like in in both uh adaptations there is a lot more agency and focus given to the female characters in Mm -hmm. in in the stories so yeah um it's definitely not as present in homer's adaptation excuse me homer's uh poem iliad because uh i think it's just his mentality that he would have had at the time They're, they're obviously important in his but uh, I think, especially in Troy, Fall of a City, like women are a huge, huge part of why the story is is ongoing and progressing. Definitely. In two in the two thousand four, I think it's a little bit more, um, how do I say, realistic in the sense that, like, it's definitely a story of men having this quarrel about this woman who's kind of, at at a certain point, becomes almost like an object or a prize, really. Yeah. More than she is a person because. She represents then, like, uh, you know, again, like you mentioned, ego, the, mm-hmm. the ego of a man and his worth. Mm-hmm. So it's not like she's a person in her own right. It's like he, uh, she's like this symbol of, you know. Yeah, it's a political and economic transaction, basically. <laughs> yeah. To have Helen. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's a lot different. But in Troy, Fall of a City, there's absolutely, like, 90% of it is focused on troy the actual trojan city yeah and the trojan characters etc it's their experience of a trojan war because you're for the most part you're actually in the palace you're with the royal family you're with paris and hector and with andromache and priam the king and queen hecuba yes queen hecuba yeah 
Oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah, Queen Hecuba is the one I like. Andromache yeah. is the one Andromache, I can't stand. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so for that reason, it's actually kind of interesting because we're seeing it almost like the... They're presented almost like they're victims of of the war mm-hmm. in a way. Mm-hmm. As opposed to the original story intention, which is they're like the actual bad guys. Yeah. So it's kind of flipping the script in a big way. To me, it's 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 as interesting because it's kind of for those of us who have a more broader understanding of these of these things in terms of history and themes and that kind of thing it's showing that this war really is amoral in a way and that really all war kind of is because each side or sides if there's many i mean here there's only two but they all have a belief that they're doing the right thing by fighting it. Mm-hmm. And they believe that they're defending their families and they're defending their children and their homeland, etc. by waging it. And, you know, seeing 2004 Troy versus Troy Fall of a City show, uh, in both of them, you kind of see like that, um, that message come out, which is that um, either side has... Uh, definite cause to go to war in their minds and uh, it's not pre- it's not really presented uh, in such a stark manner like it's Lord of the Rings or something where there's absolutely a good side and absolutely an evil side that's like rampaging and mm-hmm. you know killing and in the show as well there's a lot more almost loyalty to the plot of Homer's Iliad um, there's the inclusion of the the beauty contest between the three goddesses uh, the influence of the gods, like the actual gods, is actually there. It's not just um, King Priam. So in the 2004 movie, King Priam is just absolutely like a god worshiper. He worships worships uh, Apollo, but Apollo never appears. But in the show, um, these mythical figures actually um, appear. And a lot of people have their grievances against the, the show, Um but one of the coolest sort of scenes for me was when they were going to the Greeks and the Trojans were going to face um, battle on a field and the three goddesses were amongst them just walking and they were blessing each of the heroes. So uh, like Hera and Athena were blessing Ajax and um, Menelaus and Agamemnon and then um, Aphrodite was blessing Hector and Paris and whoever else was um, on the side of the Trojans. So I thought that was pretty cool, um, just visually speaking. Um, But yeah, something that both... (laughs) Going back to it. (laughs) So something that both adaptations portray equally is the violence and the consequences of war. So the, the final scenes of the actual burning of Troy is just... Oh my god, like I was physically shuddering. Like Morgan, like you you can attest to this. Like I was just like, "Oh my god, there's like rape and like there's babies flying everywhere." Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just so awful. Yeah. Like I'm laughing about it now, but I was like, "Oh, this yeah. is like going to mess me up." It, yeah, it's a very very realistic looking mm-hmm. uh massacre yeah. and destruction scene. Like it's just, whoa, you know. Yeah. It's uh it's pretty heavy, and that's why, and I think they do that too, because they really want to make it the, like, you know, crescendo of the tragedy. Yeah. I kind of would have liked it if they just ended it with the horse coming through the gates, and then, that was it. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, you know, no. it was just, it was an offering, and no. that's it. No. But I think Homer is kind of like this anti-war hippie that really wanted to <laughs> send the point, to uh, get the point across that war is some bad shit. <laughs> This is I, why. I think the key uh, that we can take away from this podcast is that George R. R. Martin is the direct descendant of Homer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's yeah. basically the same thing. So where are the hive mind aliens? <laughs> yeah. And you know, yeah, the the, the, the zombie, the uh, nuclear bunkers. Yeah, and shit. <laughs> where's all that in, in this Trojan War? The zombie last heroes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay, I say, oh my gosh, what the fuck am I? Like, you're two? ten years old. Yeah. God, yeah. Oh my oh, fucking god! Oh my gosh! The the tunnels in Troy. Yes. Those are those nuclear bunkers. Oh right my there. god! Isn't that Game amazing? Game of Thrones is Troy confirmed. Yeah, and we're oh really? we're gonna talk yeah. about a uh, little bit of Benjamin Stark. Yes, there. and and Sean Bean and yeah. uh, oh my god, that's still yeah. There's subliminal. there's really weird parallels between yeah. <laughs> these two stories as stories and then the casting choices that were made. Like yeah. this is yeah, <laughs> that's it's so funny. there's we're gonna talk about those in a little bit. What was yeah. your question? 
Or what were you talking about think, before? Oh, just I... the violence of the... Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's jacked up. Yeah. Something that's different between the show and the movie is the influence and the, the mytholo- mythology of the gods and how it's added into and woven into the story. So in the in the show, it's actually pretty loyal to uh, Homer's Iliad in that it has the beauty contest in it. It has the sort of the favorings of the gods a bit more clearly and the gods are actually people. So in the movie, all you see, as you said, it's a very secular sort of rendering of the story. All you see is King Priam being super god worshipping, like he worships Apollo, but mm-hmm. Apollo never appears. Yeah. But in um, in the show, the goddesses appear, Zeus is there, um, there's all sorts of deities and magic shit going on. Something that's interesting is that a lot of people have a lot of flack to give to the show, but I think one of my favorite scenes is that in that was um, something very unique and something that I haven't really seen before. But it was a scene where um, the two sides, the Greeks and the Trojans, were finally meeting each other. Mm-hmm. And as they were meeting, there were the, the three goddesses walking with them. And you, you hear them like blessing the heroes of their respective sides. So Hera and Athena were blessing like Ajax and Menelaus and Agamemnon. And then you see Aphrodite on... Um, the Trojan side blessing Paris and Hector and Aeneas and the rest of them. So I thought that was just like yeah. a cool scene. And then they just hit each other and you're like, blah, 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 blah. yeah, you know, yeah, I think they did it decently. I feel like the, again, the 2004 movie is a little bit more realistic in yeah. the sense that I don't think there would have been that talk. Uh, I don't think they would have allowed them to come into the palace unless they were like dictating peace terms or trying to defuse the, uh, the uh, ensuing conflict. So lastly, responsibility is a theme. Your actions have definite consequences, and it's kind of interesting how when you bring gods and worship into it, it's kind of, you know, your decisions are then influenced or can be even overturned by these outside forces. The reason why I liked the 2004 version so much uh, in regards to this point is, like, every action has a direct, like, real-world consequence. Um, even though there's that one scene where Brad Pitt goes and cuts the head off of, uh, the statue of Apollo at the Mm. temple on the beach. And then of course he ends up dying later and people say, oh, well that's, you know, that's Apollo getting back at, back Mm. at, you know, back at him. Someone gets killed. They're just dead. Yeah. You know, a duel happens. Someone loses it. That person's just gone. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, you steal someone's wife, you ins- you piss off a king, of, a Greek king, you get the army that comes with that. Yes. <laughs> so, and there's a weird lack of responsibility that we see from many of the characters. And we've talked about how we don't like Paris because he's obviously the most irresponsible character of the mm-hmm. entire the entire story. But there's also the responsibility of Hector, who it, it portrays, it, he's a positive example of this because... He um, unabashedly and without any like hesitation defends his brother, defends his uh, his nation, his family, and he goes right out into battle and is you know is a commander and a warrior. Mm-hmm. Um, so he is the I guess the embodiment of like the best form of responsibility, especially male responsibility in, mm-hmm. in, in warfare. Um, Helen is an example I think of bad responsibility in at least in, you know in these adaptations because. You know, she, especially in this in the show, yeah. shows a lot of remorse for what she's doing, but she's also just so like emotional and just like lacks a lot of control. Mm-hmm. And she leaves her daughter. And yeah, it, it's in the Iliad as well. Like that's what happens. She leaves her nine year old daughter, I believe. Her yeah. name is Hermione. It's just crazy, right? Like, yeah. yeah it, How could like yeah? I for mean, for yeah. this, you know, this dude who has this like Trojan prince mullet thing going on. <laughs> put a picture of Orlando yeah. Bloom as, as a Paris. Yeah. It, it just and I think I know why they show that in the show and not really in the movie and it has to do with female agency and we talked a bit about choice and yep. um, how Helen has, seems to have a bit more choice in the show um, and she has this responsibility to her daughter but she's just so sick of being like this this piece of cat- cattle essentially like a prize wives are for breeding 
Yeah. Like, yeah. In a stupid Irish accent. Oh, it's, my God. It's the same, <laughs> Brendan Gleeson. Yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> Freaking Mad-Eye Moody is playing this Greek commander. Okay. Mad-Eye Moody. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah, so it, it has to do with her being sick of being a, a mother and um, having to be this queen of Sparta and, like, bowing to this husband that she doesn't love. Yeah. Yeah, yeah th- there's this weird, um, almost modern thing going on where it's, yeah. you know, I'm unhappy, so I'm going to do something that is completely and utterly irresponsible to try to make myself happy exactly. but the consequences are so fucking bad yeah. that i mean you know it's obvious right like what happens yeah. and they're so desperate too like i know they, they, yeah they yeah, know yeah, that yeah. they won't they, this yeah. won't turn out well and they're just so de- they're like oh maybe we can send a peace envoy and maybe we can run away but no and it's just like oh my god guys come on i know it's yeah, yeah. it's it's very kind of fr- it's very frustrating yes there's never like these these nice easy solutions to any of these kinds of problems it's always going to be a pretty uh, stern consequence one way or the other for anything that, that happens mm-hmm. and yeah. who are we to judge like i'm sure like everyone's human everyone makes choices that they regret at the end and kind of it's there to el- like um illuminate those decisions that we make and going off what you just said, in the film we see, even though there are bad decisions have been made and there's many been many mistakes and there are so many ethical and moral considerations and people's lives are at stake and the whole city's at stake, um, we still see when people make decisions, they stand by them mm-hmm. uh, for the most part, especially the characters who are very, you know, default responsible. Um, they stand by their family. There's, again, the decisions are being that are being made they hold their positions and they fight. And I think that, that, you know, there maybe that's what Homer's trying to get across in some respect, that that's admirable. Mm-hmm. That, you know, despite what the, what the situation is, if you hold by your position, uh, you're more likely to have the outcome that you want, which seems like a very obvious thing to say. Mm-hmm. But uh, when it's literally life and death and the fate of a, basically a civilization... Uh, this is becomes you know something that should be in the forefront of everybody's mind i think all right so throughout the podcast we've been talking about all these different characters uh just kind of in passing we've also talked about some specifics but now we kind of want to speak about uh the differences and similarities between the characters in the two contemporary uh adaptations of the story uh in 2004 film and troy fall of the city on netflix so we're starting with Paris. Well, we've already outlined that I really do not like Paris in either adaptation. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually, I actually like him a lot more in Fall of the City because I think that he kind of gets that he is very much responsible for what's going on, and he actually, beca- he actually becomes courageous towards the end. The one in the film is just like he's so spineless. Even though at one point he actually does get the balls to go and fight Menelaus directly, yeah, yeah. it's just like. It's pitiful. It, yeah, I mean, he, he's so, he's not at all a fighter. He's not experienced, but he is like this spoiled doughboy mm-hmm. prince of Troy, right? So he's just used yeah. to getting what he wants. And I, I feel like throughout the entire film, he really does not have any concept of the consequences, or at least he doesn't fully recognize them. Mm-hmm. I remember you were like, why are they showing no emotion whatsoever? Like when they're seeing yeah. all these people die and like, it's just, I think it's because they're stunned, mm-hmm. but they still have no concept of how this relates to what they did. Uh, this They being uh, Helen and Paris. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's almost like a, a critique of young generations who are increasingly getting more <laughs> distanced from actually showing emotions because when you're looking at things on a screen you don't need to show emotions or anything so it's almost like reflective of that but yeah um for me paris is almost like a, a green knight of summer from game of thrones he's like he's like <laughs> someone from renly's um retinue because he 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 talks the big talk he's like yeah i'm gonna like i'll i'll fight to the death if if it comes to that if if that's gonna save helen from menelaus and then his brother, like, on the ship, when they're going back home, he's literally like, what do you know about fighting and what do you know about love? Yeah. Like, he, you're just a green boy. You you know nothing, um, <laughs> summer child, yeah, whatever, exactly. you know? <laughs> My sweet summer child. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of that. And I think 
if Legolas didn't have his bow and arrow skills and he was like a like a spoilt little brat, if Thranduil was a, a little bit of a, 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 <laughs> a bad parent, it, it, he would be Paris. Because like, I could totally see that Legolas sort of... Act- okay, so Orlando Bloom obviously portrays yeah. Paris in well, the movie. It was done... So. It was in 2004, same year as Return of the King. I think was it was the two- year 2003? after. 2003? Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's the same guy. <laughs> yeah. And he's definitely got that influence in his acting. Yeah. Like, he's so. stating the obvious. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, just, he's flouncing around, you know. Yeah. But, like, he's a lot less spineless than Legolas, so. Oh, I love Legolas would have been, like, the biggest help ever to the yeah. children's side if he actually was part of this but the one thing that paris does in the movie and maybe in the show um he he shoots achilles uh in the heel and renders him inert basically and then he kills him he yeah. kills achilles like almost by accident <laughs> yeah because <I know. laughs> oh my god yeah. i literally screamed this is such a mess in that scene because yeah, so briseis is paris's cousin and uh, Achilles saves Briseis during the sacking of the city and they're hugging and kissing and they're like oh my god like you're my love and then Paris comes in and shoots Achilles and Briseis is like no Paris stop yeah he doesn't stop of course yeah so Briseis was taken captive but then he fell in she fell in love with Achilles and so she has this affinity to both sides but um because he was on his man period <laughs> Paris did not listen and he just kept shooting Achilles until he died and Briseis is just like god damn so she escapes with Paris and I don't know if that happens in the does does the Paris in the TV show kill no, Achilles? No. No, no. Oh, oh, oh I think he does if okay. I remember but he has, he actually dies he's killed yes yeah he is he is murdered yeah. he <laughs> which is kind of like yeah it does render a more sympathetic view of Paris in, in the show because he doesn't survive but freaking and isn't that kind of weird though because the the greeks come to destroy troy but the fact that a prince of troy is still alive like yeah. you know doesn't that mean that the the bloodline continues and there's always going to be a threat of vengeance and all that yeah well the, th- the thing is i think in the film that uh they act, the greeks didn't know about the tunnels right, right whereas in the show they seem to really know a lot but we of course that's because helen is uh, a traitor really because mm-hmm. she actually sells secrets at some point or, yeah. or, or gives them up kind of unwillingly really like, stupidly yeah yeah, yeah. Um, because achilles visits her in the in the night and there's that whole sort of weird plot with the the fat servant who yeah comes yeah. and watches that but it's anyway, really weird she is yeah. so despicable in the in the tv show at certain yeah. points she's like she has no control or and no idea of like what she's doing yeah and of course, in the end, she experiences the full horror of like all the shit that she's like basically responsible for. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so we can go right into talking about Helen right now. Yeah. Because we're on the on the topic, <laughs> and honestly, like in that end scene in the show, like she's sailing away with Menelaus, and Menelaus is all like sn- smug and like haha, and um. And I was just like, how I would throw myself off the ship at this point. But yeah. she's just like a, a statue. She just boards the ship and she goes and she's like, yeah, this mm. this was something in my past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something I did one summer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God. She, you literally like single-handedly destroyed a city. And also, she's the one who like made the secret truce with the Greeks and was like, okay, if you don't harm any Greeks, I will come home with you. Yeah. And obviously, Menelaus, Menelaus is like, yeah, let's do it. And then she leaves and... Paris thinks that she's betraying him and all this shit. And then, lo and behold, the Greeks don't hold their side of the bargain and they come and destroy the city. And she's like, what are you doing? And it's like, are you stupid? Yeah, you really think that that was going to be, yeah. be honored by... yeah. So that's the other thing. It's like that um, dual motive of um, restoring your honor, but then also claiming more political land and all of that by gaining Troy as well um, mm-hmm. for the Greeks. <laughs> so so what do you think about hector well i like hector <laughs> <laughs> that's about it he's yeah. he's like you know he's the he's the honorable man he does the right thing mm-hmm. he has the horrible tragedy of being 
a, a new father and then he dies he just he does all the right things um yeah. he gives the right counsel but it's the kings and all the people above him that give the wrong decisions and... yeah he's your classic yeah. nice guy basically yeah <laughs> he's <laughs> yeah he's a nice guy that's actually able to fight and uh you know he's your aragorn but in this in this rendering he does not survive no no he does not he does not he dies in combat facing achilles mm -hmm. but yeah but hector is kind of like the um basically the opposite or the uh foil what's i don't know yeah like the mirror image of achilles whatever mm -hmm. yeah i i remarked that um while we were watching the movie that hector and achilles probably would have been like best friends if they yeah. were on the same side yeah because, absolutely yeah they're such like bros and they're good at fighting and they have a code of honor um and it was really moving in the movie when brad pitt like breaks down and cries over his corpse after king priam visits him in the night to yeah. ask for the corpse back after the duel yeah um and he he cries over the body and he's like oh i'll see you again my brother and it, there was literally no relationship besides that of violence and uh, like the whole movie was just like oh like we can't wait until these two fight basically like because they're like two legendary fighters yeah like, exactly. there's all this foreshadowing of them fighting each other yeah, but, it was yeah. a neat kind of scene because like, there is that there is that understanding that uh, they are in the same position really, and mm -hmm. that they're in like this big stupid conflict, and like it's just a huge waste of yeah, like everything. Um, but also, I think as Achilles realizes as time goes on that he is definitely not going to leave Troy alive. Like he realizes, I think that mm -hmm. um, he's going to reach his end, and I think that killing Hector was kind of his last hurrah, basically. Mm -hmm. And it was yeah. kind of like the price that he has to pay now, which is he will uh, experience what his mother had uh, predicted, which is what he's, he's not going to leave. Yeah. And his fate was tied to Hector's, I believe, because in the myth, um, he was uh, prophesied to not live long after Hector dies. So yeah. once Hector dies, he's screwed, basically. So And he brought it about his own doom. So he kind of just knew that from the beginning. And he, he just turned into... From this like um, sort of swashbuckling, sort of egocentric, like yeah, I'm the best, to like this ball of rage, and that's all he was towards Agamemnon, and then Hector, and then he just burns out. Yeah, and, yeah. And all he cared about was saving Briseis, and then he dies. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of sad. sad. Like yeah, the last thing that he does is like a, a good, like a really good thing. And... Yeah. It was so sweet when he was like, you brought me peace in a lifetime of war. Yeah. And then he dies. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. just stop it. There were so many like early 2000s moments in that, <laughs> in that movie. It was like so cheesy. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, know, it, it, it was really well done though in mm -hmm. that regard. And uh, yeah, so, we, you know, Achilles and then Patroclus yes. is... Patroclus. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, Achilles' cousin, or you know, he's related to him somehow. Yeah, and in the show, uh, probably not. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of loving going mm -hmm. on, I yes. should say. Yeah, so a very intimate friend, let's say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's that scene on the beach. Yes, with Briseis. Yeah. Very interesting. They have a very fun time on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but like their their best buds, um, Achilles is way older than Patroclus, or somewhat older at least. Mm -hmm. pa Patroclus is basically like like a boy in in the eyes of Achilles, and he's, you know, he's a capable fighter, but he's not experienced as much in mm -hmm. in, in warfare. He's not as good, and yeah, he does have that that really tragic role of um, pretending to be Achilles when an attack is launched uh, against the, the city walls. And he gets killed by Hector, and it's just like, oh, yeah, I killed Achilles' cousin, so now the full wrath of Achilles is going to be rained down on. Yeah. And so for that reason, he's kind of a, a remarkable character, because mm -hmm. he's kind of like a sacrificial lamb that... Yeah, yeah he's kind of interesting, because he doesn't really have a purpose beyond being someone to show Achilles' emotion through, because otherwise Achilles is... He doesn't yes. hold to anyone... He doesn't hold to a certain king, a certain nation, a certain whatever. He loves his parents, and that's about it. And then there's Patroclus and his love for him. 
So it's, it's very interesting that, uh, again, because it's a tragedy, everyone dies. And that's sort of the tragedy of it, is that he loses this one person. And it's also, I think, Patroclus dies just as Tro the Trojans have the upper hand because Achilles um, takes back the Myrmidons, which are his sort of fabled group of... Um, yeah, his warriors. Yes, yeah, yeah his God-blessed warriors. I think they're like blessed by Zeus or sons of Zeus or something like that and so he takes them away from the fight and he's like we're not fighting um, and so Agamemnon was like oh fuck we're gonna lose So, <laughs> and Hector was like his army was gonna win but then he sl slays Patroclus and then he's like oh fuck and then that's when the whole tide turns because Ach Achilles comes back into the fight to um, avenge um, his cousin and not really to fight for Agamemnon but Agamemnon was like, yeah, Patroclus just saved us the this war. Yeah, basically. he actually says that line in the movie. He's like, oh, what yeah. a piece of shit this yeah, guy is. Yeah, honestly. Oh, my God. No, no sense of emotion. Yeah. Yeah, and we talked about Briseis quite a lot so far. But yeah, yeah. he's... he. She in the... Uh, I think in both adaptations, she's a daughter of Apollo. Uh, is she not? No. Or... Oh, yeah, actually. Yeah, because she yeah. comes from that other city yeah she's yeah. she's a priestess yes. and uh yeah she's the cousin of uh paris and hector mm -hmm. and so she's obviously um a member of the trojan nation in this regard yeah the, Tro the, the trojan side of the, of the war um yeah she gets captured by achilles and is like a concubine basically mm -hmm. um but yeah again they fall in love and achilles shows a lot of mercy and like it becomes um shows adoration towards her later yeah and uh of course Menel uh excuse me Agan Memnon uses her as kind of this way to toy with and manipulate Achilles mm -hmm. um, but of course this doesn't work in Menel uh, Agan Memnon I keep on mixing them up because yeah. they're both just I know they're like the bastards. single entity of just being like <laughs> shitty so. yeah yeah and the thing about Briseis which I mentioned earlier was that she's part of both sides so she's kind of like she's probably the most tortured person because she yeah, has yeah. feelings for Achilles. Which, which she starts out as, yeah. as as in the Trojan side, but yeah, the bench, yeah. The, the the allegiance definitely changed. But I don't think it's really she's with the Greek side. In, no, in not sense. at all. She's she's in love with uh, a warrior fighting for the Greeks. Yes, yeah. but it's w definitely a lot more complicated. Yeah, yeah. I think she above all kind of knows this the meaninglessness of it all, right? Because she can see from both sides, and she. I mean, obviously, the soldiers kind of understand that they could have. If they had born been born in Troy instead of Greece, they would have been fighting for that side. It's just sort of so arbitrary, right? Yeah, it's just um, like an implied duty. Yeah. yeah, and Briseis kind of gets the brunt of that because she loses so many people from both. Oh, well, yeah, from both sides. Yep. Odysseus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Odysseus. Yeah. yeah, he actually has to be kind of convinced, shall we say, to go and uh, fight with the Greeks because. He pretends to be crazy, mm -hmm. and so he's just plowing away at his field, sowing salt, and then uh, to test if he's actually insane, the uh, the men who are trying to collect him for the cause, uh, they place his his baby in front of the plow, and they're like, okay, if he runs over the baby, <laughs> then we know he is certified fucking <laughs> crazy, and so we're not going to bother. Of course, he stops, he folds, he joins. Yeah. Like, hey, you're this brilliant guy, you know how to scheme, you're like a kind of a trickster kind of character. Mm -hmm. And um, that's really the role that he he plays in both. Um, he's this cunning, uh, he has this razor sharp intelligence, and he knows like how to manipulate people with speech, and he knows how to convince people to do things. Mm -hmm. And um, he's an interesting character as well because... He is one who actually does have a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And he, I think he deliberately overlooks a lot of the things that are, that are um, like bad or deceitful um, because he knows that the broader cause has to be, has to be won. And there's kind of, again, there's that twisted ethics that we're, that we're kind of seeing in, in all adaptations. But yeah, he is portrayed by the actor who plays Benjamin Stark in <laughs> Game of Thrones in, in the show version of the uh let me look up story. his name what's his name benjamin yeah. stark actor fact checking uh, going on joseph mall molly mall mall yeah 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 he's a very interesting looking fellow yeah he looks like a fox sort of yeah like a fox 
I was gonna say like a ferret, but that's kind of mean. But I don't think he's that ugly looking. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. But yeah, he plays Odysseus in the show. In the show version, yeah. And, and the film. Guess who? <laughs> good old Sean Bean, who remarkably does not die in this war movie. I was just gonna say yeah. that. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Does he? Does Odysseus die in the Odyssey? No, no, no. He he oh makes my it home. God. He experiences so much danger. Yeah. And so many crazy still... things. Yeah. That's so funny because I think someone literally did a calculation and he dies in like ninety nine percent of the films that he's yeah like part of. That's insane. <laughs> we just watched the Frankenstein Chronicles. Oh my god. What's there? Yeah, and of course. Yeah. So, of course, he dies, but you know, not to spoil anything, but he gets reborn. <laughs> yeah, not Shall to spoil anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. It's an interesting twist to the usual stereotypical Sean Bean <laughs> death, let's say. Yeah. Like they still wanted to have it, but <laughs> he's too important a character to just have completely killed off, so I bet he, he agreed to that role just because he was like, Oh, this is this is gonna <laughs> titillate my fans. We're gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he was great as a as Odysseus. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the interesting thing about Odysseus is that he is unwilling almost to do all these tricksy things against the trojans because again mm. he he's he's smart enough to know that this is just a ploy to uh, accrue land and pride and stuff you know on the yeah behalf. he knows this is all bullshit and a yeah. giant waste of exactly of everything right yeah but he still he does his deceitful thing because he's ordered to so he does the dutiful um thing i think he wants also the recognition like undoubtedly right you know, yeah so yeah, that's probably also part of it. In in the show, he's a bit more tortured, but that's because it's Benjamin Stark. <laughs> King Priam or Priam, depending on how. I I, I think the the Brits like in the documentaries they're yeah. like Priam. Priam. Yeah. Yes. I, I think yeah. sounds sounds nicer for sure. Yeah. Priam. Priam. <laughs> yeah, that's the Canadian way of saying it. I think the Greek way is Priamos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah, Priamos. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, he's the king of Troy. Old man. Mm-hmm. Uh, in both adaptations, film and show, he is uh, an honorable man, very wise. He's uh, a great uh, commander in many ways. Uh, he know, and he's very level-headed, which is like a re- really remarkable thing. And um, he's, you know, a good strategist. And uh, I feel like actually, you know, in, we talked about how in the movie he's this religious guy, and I was mm-hmm. kind of ranting at one point because he makes a lot of decisions based on just this belief in in the gods and, and the fates and of course is this he has he was the one who decided to bring the trojan horse into troy mm-hmm. and it's you know if he just would have done what uh, uh paris was saying and just mm-hmm. burned it you know f- for all we know like that that wouldn't have happened i mean they wouldn't have gone into the city and opened the gates mm-hmm. for the rest of the army to get in so yeah the, you know you know he makes some he makes mistakes to be sure in uh the show he is see, i think he's a, a lot more empathetic as opposed to the the film he's maybe a little bit more stoic and kind yeah. of like kingly in that regard mm-hmm. in the show he seems kind of like he's a really a, a dad yeah but he has a lot of sense of responsibility for uh uh his family and the city and again his city and uh and a lot of eyeliner yeah, exactly. I know. He's got <laughs> like guy. he's got the beard where he's got yeah. the mustache portion of the beard is charcoal. Yeah. And then he's got the white beard. Yeah. Yeah, and, and he's got more eyeliner than like Rihanna. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and he has he wears like this weird turban thing at some point. I guess yeah, they're they're in Turkey, so that's yeah. kind of like yeah, oh, that could be a garb, but yeah, it's kind of strange. Yeah, well, it, it, it's an Asiatic like yes. nation right so <laughs> what was that quote from menelaus we in will rain down destruction on your asiatic heads yeah it was kind of oh funny when he, when he said it <laughs> <laughs> i just burst out laughing like asiatic heads is that a slur <laughs> yeah well because at that in that time like uh that was cons- that's called asia minor like turkey is asia minor right, right. so um i think another thing about priam is yeah, he does show a lot of emotion and empathy for a king um, on in both roles, I think, because he goes in that touching scene to Achilles to ask back for his bro- um, his son's corpse. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just steals into, into the camp. Um, in the myth, um, he is led by Hermes, so he's not detected by any other um, Greek soldier. 
Yeah. So he makes it into Achilles' tent and he he kisses his hands. And I actually read that part in the Iliad. And he, he says, I did something that no other man has done. I have kissed the hands of the man who murdered my son. And I was like, oh my God, damn. Yeah, yeah. It was such an emotional scene because they they're both, again, good men who are just fighting for the wrong reasons. And well, yeah. for what they believe is right, but... Yeah, just, but they're, they're admired yeah. in this conflict that's making them do things that are just, you know... Yes, heinous and probably not what they personally want to do yeah. after they've realized who each other, um, who is on the other side. Oh, boy. Okay, we're going to do Agamemnon and Menelaus together because, again, <laughs> yeah. there's just no... I, One I, evil unit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there is actually significant differences in how they're portrayed in the, in the film and the show. Um, Menelaus in the film is a lot more menacing, and he actually seems like mm-hmm. he's a real king. Yeah. Who was uh, like has like a lot of wrath, and of course they you know they get a nice Irish actor to portray <laughs> this, this Spartan king. <laughs> Um, but yeah, he is like um, he reminds me almost like a, a, like a Robert Baratheon kind of character. Yes, yeah. You know, like, like he, an evil Robert Baratheon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, man who loves his women, loves his wine. <laughs> he loves conquering, and but his brother Agamemnon is really the you know piece of shit par excellence in in this whole <laughs> this whole tale because uh, he is obsessed with uh, conquest and he wants to have a Greek empire and he wants more gold and territory and he wants more armies to fight more campaigns and mm-hmm. yeah i mean in, in in both adaptations he's just so obviously portrayed as like this malevolent kind of character yeah um you know but uh i think in i actually think in the show he's a little bit more ballsy and, and involved i think like the the, the king agamemnon in uh the film is a little bit more like, yeah, I, I pretend to lead from the front, but I just oh stand God. back while all my men go and, you know, these go to their deaths. Yeah. And yeah. I expect perfection, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. He, he's such an asshole leader because you see him in the front when he's um, uh, initiating that duel for Menelaus and Paris. <laughs> yeah. And then he's like, oh, we're going to, okay, we have to kill them now. And then you you see all these people fighting and then like 10 minutes later you see him in the back like rah, yeah rah, yeah because he was like charged and his yeah. chariot did not move yeah. just, <laughs> everyone else moved forward like, he's yeah. such a fat fuck yeah um, i know yeah he's fat yeah. like he was yeah. a big tubby guy yeah yeah and, the, and the, yeah. i think it was the armor principally like they made them both look huge yeah well i mean you could the armor was sleeveless at a certain point you can see his flat yeah, arms he's, his, his chicken arms. Yeah, chubber. Yeah, he did not have any muscle. He was not fighting any wars. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's one of those men. I don't know if you said this or if I said this, but we talked about how... Oh, no, it, it was in the movie. Never mind. We're not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> you got, you're giving us way too much credit. Yeah. Um, where they were talking about how uh, old men talk. No, young men kill. Young men are dying and old men are talking. Or something yes, like yeah, that. I yeah, think Achilles yeah. says it. One of those prophetic points, or those uh, enlightened points in the lore. Yes. Yeah, because Achilles is like, like Brad Pitt makes him very philosophical um, in that in that respect because he's so self-critical and kind of analyzes why he's doing things and why other people are doing things. But um, basically, Agamemnon is one of those people that just orders things to happen and then armies and armies of people just because they have pledged loyalty to this one man, go and sacrifice their lives for something they don't directly relate to. Yeah. Um, I think the show makes them more sympathetic because they go with the original tale with the Iliad in that he has to sacrifice his daughter to um, gain favorable wins. And this is kind of weird sounding because he kills his daughter and that makes him more sympathetic. But you you kind of see, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you kind of see that he goes crazy because he kills his daughter. Yeah. He he's like what? Well, he's why locked am I doing in that? now. Like, yeah, like, we gotta win this war. We gotta exactly. destroy the city. That's that's something interesting that the show did because you can see that he's he's gone crazy mm-hmm. and he's just like what? Why am I doing this? I'm doing this for you, you useless Menelaus who lost your wife. Yeah, like and he's like in almost every scene he brings up his daughter in some way. 
Yeah. And it was just kind of like harrowing because he had to sacrifice his, his daughter. And even in the in the Iliad, that was like a huge sort of um, transgression that he had to pull. Um, it's very abnormal to have human sacrifices apparently at that time. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was something that he really had to involve himself in to, to, to see mm-hmm. this through. The Menelaus in this show is just like such a little oh, douche. He's like, oh my god, useless. Yeah, he's incompetent. He is one of these like fake tough guys that is relying on the fact that he has a brother who actually is a tough guy. <laughs> yeah, and can get shit done. Yeah, and yeah, he's just he's like an angry like teenage boy or something. Yeah, you know. Yeah, he's actually a grown man, but he's that's what he's like in in the show. He's just so annoying. Yeah, and just angry and. Of course, whenever something happens that's good, he somehow finds a way to take credit for it, or like this is, mm-hmm. you know, this is my victory that's happening. Yeah, it's just stupid. I don't. I, I really, I made it really made that duo just so hateable. Yeah, and oh. definitely, you know, a lot more explicitly the bad guys. Yes. in the tale, right, or the story, whatever. Definitely, um, and I think Menelaus in in the show is kind of like reflective of Paris in a way and like how useless he is and how he avoids responsibility oh, that's a good point. yeah that's a good point, yeah actually. yeah um maybe maybe not the paris in the show but definitely the paris in the movie who doesn't really do much to to save his his kin and his kingdom i don't know anything about age actually <laughs> you're the one who included him okay well, you can just talk about the movie one yeah because i don't remember the guy in the show yeah so Ajax is an interesting... It sounds way too much. What was he in the show, anyway? Is he even of glory! Yeah, okay. The big guy. Remember? Oh, okay, yeah. And Hector kills him. Yeah. So Ajax, in both adaptations, is just this big lumbering blue brute yeah. who wants glory and just wants to sm- smash things. Yeah. Uh, I really liked... Uh, his portrayal in the movie because he's just this huge fucking guy huge he's got this war hammer <laughs> and this big um, it's like a tower shield so mm-hmm. he just he's able to knock people off their horses and knock the horse over too damn yeah and so there's that one really cool scene where he's they're storming the beach when they first land and uh, he's just smashing people like, <laughs> just taking them apart and he ends up being killed by Hector in, in the in the, yes. in the film and uh, they have a really, really close fight, though. Like, he, and he's just so big and tough. Like, so he gets stabbed a couple times, and oh my god, yeah, yeah. He actually ends. He's strangling Hector. Like, he's lifting him up, strangling yeah. him. And but he, but Hector's stabbed him like in the gut, and you know, eventually, like, he dies, and it's just so, like so crazy. Yeah, he was really, really scary. Just like this beast. Yes. You know, kind of like a like a a Clegane character yes yeah I was I think I said that where he he would make a good mountain as well yeah exactly yeah Yeah. right right yeah yeah and Ajax obviously lent his name to the cleaning product (laughs) and Ajax Ontario (laughs) (laughs) this is a city of Ontario Canada yeah I think it's like between Toronto and Ottawa or something yeah somewhere somewhere up there somewhere wherever yeah so he's another hero that I guess does he appear in other um, stories in the Iliad? I don't know. I don't. Yeah, this is something I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know that. Yeah, but he um, is one of those heroes that. Uh, he definitely is. Yeah, I'm sure he shows up other in other other places. Yeah. Aeneas. Aeneas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not interesting pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I saw this article recently that said that uh, Uranus. Uranus. Yeah. Uranus, yes. uh, Uranus, Uranus, uh, smells like rotten eggs. No. Yeah, they figured really? that out somehow. Oh my god! Oh, cause sulfur, maybe. I think that's yeah. That, <laughs> it has to it. be it. So, Uranus stinks. So, yeah, I'm sure. Why? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? You know, this is like going on. Right? <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Please don't forget that. Just kind of came out. Oh yeah. man. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, so Aeneas, um, he is a young boy in the Troy movie, mm-hmm. but in and he's not at all. He's he's there for two seconds. Yeah, basically. you've yeah. never seen him before. Yeah. But uh, Aeneas in the show is actually a commander, and he's probably 
um, one of Hector's like most trustworthy sort of war counselors as well. Uh, played by Pomeranian face Dean. Thomas, what's his actual name? Yeah. Oh God. Yeah, the the actor just... who played Dean Thomas in Harry Potter. Yeah. Who's just unmistakable because he's like this tall. He <laughs> kind of gangly. Oh right, yeah. Alfred Enoch. But yeah, he he tries to to seduce the the queen of the amazons because the amazons somehow play into the show yeah they're there wild yeah yeah that was interesting yeah and she basically said i'm a lesbian and then he's like (laughs) okay and then he just (laughs) he walks away (laughs) yeah but he survives um and according to the myths by homer like homer's original uh writings uh he goes on to find found the city of rome Mm mm-hmm Quite interesting, because we, you know, according to the Roman tradition, it was Romulus yes. who did it. And I don't know if Aeneas 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 was, uh, <laughs> I don't know if he changed his name to Romulus, but I'm not thinking that's mm. not what happened. Um, yeah. But it's actually a very interesting um, concept that Troy lives on in the, you know, the, the, city and then great empire of rome yeah that lasted for hundreds of years that's very true yeah so or actually it was for me, you know, thousands, thousands? Of, yeah, yeah a long time if you mm-hmm. if you include going all the way up to the sack of constantinople mm-hmm. in 1453 by the ottoman empire you know what's interesting is that uh, alexander the great wait sorry was he no he wasn't never mind what about Alexander the Great? Is, is he part of the Rome? Is is he part? No, of the no, he's no. he's a Macedonian right. king. Yeah. yeah. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what empire did he create then? The Macedonian Empire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I well, was gonna say. Well, he's basically a a Greek, basically, okay. um, who wanted to become the lord of Asia, and so he had this idea that glory lied in or lay in the east. Right. So he he con- and he conquered. Egypt and um, uh, basically Israel and Palestine and he, ca- he conquered all the way through you know Iraq Iran all the way to mm-hmm. Afghanistan and then he got as far as India and yeah. established these you know these satrapies and you know yeah. very very interesting because it, what he accomplished in one lifetime is just like what takes hundreds if not many you know thousands of years mm-hmm. um, that up you know that other emperors you know yeah. what i'm trying to say yeah yeah, yeah. my words kind like of... he he was just like um a, a god amongst men if if there ever was yeah. he actually started one. he styled himself one yeah. at some point cause... but uh, i bring him up because um he allegedly he thought that he was a descendant of achilles mm-hmm. and um a Achilles, we all know is kind of like a half deity invincible person so he just kind of believed that I don't, I don't know. He didn't do a 23 and me and kind of <laughs> found his, his genetic sort of uh, origins or anything. But I, um, he probably just read the Iliad and he was like, oh, yeah, the, I identify with that character. He's definitely yeah, my him. ancestor. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, someone reading, you know, the, the, the DC comics and going, yeah, this guy's Superman. He's like my great grandfather. Yeah. Man, for sure. 100%. <laughs> yeah. And allegedly, um, Alexander carried around a copy of the Iliad. As he, as he went on his adventures and conquests. Undoubtedly a source of inspiration <laughs> as he conquered many hundreds of nations and peoples. Exactly. Was is Alexander the Great like known to be a person? Yeah, no, he was he... a real he's not he's not mythology, he's not a, a no. mythical character. He's an he was an actual historical figure. Wow. Yeah, an actual king. Yeah yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, I kind of assume so, but that's I mean yeah. it's just crazy how much he, he did, whether it's right or wrong or immoral or whatever it's just kind of insane what he accomplished so what are your overall thoughts about the show and the movie they're both valuable contemporary uh renderings of this myth that uh, homer had had written as a poem many thousands of years ago and again they are attempting to keep this story current in the sense that they're you know, it, every time it gets brought up again, people pay attention to it and people want to learn what the histories are and they want to delve into the characters and understand Greek mythology more. Like, it was one of the reasons why I got the book that you had re- mentioned earlier, uh, The Greek Myth, Brief Guide to the Greek, Greek Myths by Stephen uh, Kershaw, 
it's part of the brief guide to the history mm. series like mm. there's a lot of books that are that are in that series and great books um it, you know i was in, inspired to to read about these things because i saw this film and of course you know as a kid i was like you know the weapons the armor oh my god <laughs> brad pitt just like slaying people and this big battle movie and violent and just cool but i want to learn about you know like the the military tactics and what was life like at this time in in ancient uh, greece and the bronze age and you know what was the politics like and how do they organize their societies all these kinds of things are questions that um people are i think are um prompted to to explore if they want obviously to us like you know to to most folks it's just pure entertainment value we kind of talked about this when we talked about lord of the rings in, in one of our earlier podcasts about why or, or it was fellowship actually mm-hmm. why was fellowship so um successful uh, in the sense of being commercially successful but also being something that so many people i like, love and grabbed you know jumped on board with um even people who had never read tolkien before and just because it's they're so entertaining and they're also like kind of a spellbinding medium i mean film and shows uh are visual and they're incredibly evocative in the sense that because you're having a more passive experience you're getting fed emotions and messages as opposed to when you're reading you have to use a lot of your imagination Mm -hmm. i know it's kind of a funny thing to say because we are like you and i especially are just so like adamant about like reading is in itself a great pleasure and like an amazing thing to do yeah. and to use your imagination in that way because then you can you know uh, you have your own interpretation of what you're reading even because there's so there's the reality is like there's an infinite number of ways to to see a story mm-hmm. I mean there's always what the author originally intended and um, you know there is uh, what Homer originally intended, and then there's actually what happened in history, which we don't, we will probably never know, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Um, but then there's still that meaning that we all apply, and like, what messages do we take from the film and the show, and how do we apply them to our lives in the 21st century? Yeah, dulce et utile. It's sweet yet useful, I think. Yeah, and that's that. That was like the the principle of proper rhetoric. And I think the classical times or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, if something is entertaining and also valuable um, to to a person, then it's good rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So well done, Homer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well done, Kudos. David Benioff, who wrote the screenplay for Troy. Oh, I know that's right. Yeah. <laughs> See, he also created Game of Thrones. Oh my God, there's so many parallels. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the Netflix, BBC show right we forgot to say that it was by it was associated um BBC. associate of bbc yeah um the netflix show so um yeah well done to all the adaptations and mm. uh, keeping this the story live <laughs> on that note i think that we're done for today uh, again a fascinating discussion It's been great fun, and thank you for listening. See you next time. Ciao.